Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to today's Wheatley Lecture event. We're delighted that each of you could join with us today. My name is Jason Carroll. I'm the director of the Family Initiative here at the Wheatley Institute at Brigham Young University. We are thrilled today to welcome esteemed educator, author, and scholar Ian Rowe. And Ian, thank you so much for joining with us today. We'd like to make a few acknowledgments as we get started today. We'd like to thank Zach Adamson for our prelude music today. Zach is a piano performance uh, major here at BYU. We'd also like to thank Marlene Sinclair, Cassidy Weaver, and our uh, other members of our Wheatley Institute team for all of the behind the scenes details that go into putting an event like this together. We'd also like to thank Sarah Andrews, our communications manager, and her team for the marketing efforts made for the event. In addition, we'd like to thank the many members of the BYU community, from audiovisual to building staff and their efforts to make today's lecture possible. We're also grateful to our Wheatley student scholars uh, who have been providing ushering and help with us this afternoon. We are grateful that, uh, that uh, Rich Osgoflor, our one of our associate academic vice presidents, could join with us today. We'd also like to acknowledge Paul Edwards, the director of the Wheatley Institute, who's with us as well. As is our custom at the beginning of our events, we'd like to begin with an invocation. We've asked Dr. Allie Crandall, who is a faculty fellow in our family initiative, if she'd offer the invocation for us today. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to come together to be able to learn, learn together, and we're especially grateful for Ian Rowe for being willing to come and share his uh, knowledge and experience and insights, and we ask thee to please bless us with thy spirit that we might learn and gain new insights um, that we can use to benefit, benefit thy children around the world, and we say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Crandall. Uh, as we get started, I'd like to remind everyone that this is a two-part event. So first we have uh, our lecture part of the event now, uh, but also want to make sure that everyone is aware that there will be a reception with wonderful refreshments served immediately afterwards. So you're all invited to join with us in the lower level conference room here in the Hinckley Center. So that's not ground floor, but that's the lower floor uh, that we'll all go down to after the lecture today. And we'd love to have you join with us for that reception and for a chance to, to, to meet Ian as well. Also, as you've seen on the screens, as we've been getting started, I'd like to remind everyone about our Wheatley event next week on February, November 3rd at 11 a.m. in the Varsity Theater. The Wheatley Institute, along with the Office of Civic Engagement, we're excited uh, to host the renowned journalist McKay Coppins for a question and answer session of his new book, Romney, A Reckoning. This biography of Mitt Romney's life focuses on several critical political events of the past three years and dives into Romney's candid thoughts on the current democratic crisis occurring in the United States politics. Following the discussion, Coppins will be uh, able to answer questions for the audience and will be available to sign books. So we invite you to join with us next Friday for the Coppins event as well. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Ian Rowe today. At the Wheatley Institute, we believe that agency, accountability, charity, morality, and spiritual strength are essential to human flourishing. To that end, and as striving disciples of Christ, we're committed to engaging students, scholars, thought leaders, and the public in research-supported work that fortifies the core institutions of the family, religion, and constitutional government. It is upon these core institutions that the necessary ingredients of individual and social flourishing, as well as agency, accountability, and charity are built. As part of realizing this belief is a commitment to creating spaces that we can hear from important thought leaders in our society today. Today, we're very pleased to have the opportunity to learn from Ian Rowe. Please note that after uh, Ian's remarks today, there will be a time for some question and answer uh, from the audience. 
Ian Rowe is a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute where he focuses on education and upward mobility, family formation and adoption. He's also the founder and CEO of Vertex Partnership Academies, a new network of character-based international baccalaureate public charter high schools that opened in the Bronx in 2022. Ian is also a senior visiting fellow at the Woodson Center and a senior advisor for the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. In addition to serving 10 years as CEO of Public Prep, a nonprofit network of public charter schools based in the South Bronx and the Lower East Side of Manhattan, he's held leadership positions for Teach for America, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the White House, and MTV, where he earned two public service Emmys. After receiving a high school diploma in electrical engineering from Brooklyn Technical High School, he earned a Bachelor of Science degree in computer science engineering from Cornell University's College of Engineering. He then earned an MBA from Harvard's Business School, where he was the first black editor-in-chief of the Harvest, the Harvard Business School newspaper. Ian resides in Pelham, New York with his wife and two children. Of particular importance to our lecture today uh, is the fact that Ian published last year a landmark book entitled Agency, the four-point plan for all children to overcome the victimhood narrative and discover their pathway to power. In his book, Ian highlights the quote that, he highlights, quote, that every child in America deserves to know that a path to a successful life exists and that they have the power to follow it. In trying to address the challenges of this pattern, he has introduced a model that he calls the free model, which emphasizes four pillars that make this most possible for children, family, education, religion, education, and entrepreneurship. As you can see, Ian is a thought leader who is addressing some of the most significant issues of our time. Please join me in welcome Ian Rowe to the stand. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, the entire uh, Wheatley Institute family for having me. I'm very excited uh, to talk about this topic of agency versus equity. What should be the path, what should be the pathway forward for American education? Uh, let me start by saying that uh, gradually, for more than a decade, then suddenly, with the death of George Floyd, America has faced a national reckoning on race. Among the questions we are grappling with, what needs to happen in order for African Americans and young people of all races to prosper? Given the necessity to tap into the potential of all students for America to remain competitive as a nation on a global scale. Answering this question requires centering our attention specifically to the realm of education. As Jason said, I wrestle with this question not only as a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, but also as a practitioner. From 2010 to 2020, I was CEO of a nonprofit network of public charter elementary and middle schools in the heart of the South Bronx and the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Our faculty had the solemn responsibility to educate more than 2,000 students, primarily low-income black and Hispanic kids, whose parents entered a random lottery for our schools because they wanted a chance for their children to develop the skills and habits to become agents of their own uplift and to build a better life. And each year, we had approximately 200 to 300 uh, open incoming seats, but we had nearly 5,000 families on our wait list, eager for the opportunity for their child to live the American dream. This isn't surprising, given that among traditional district schools in District 12 in the Bronx, only 7% of the nearly 2,000 public school students beginning ninth grade in 2015, four years later, graduated ready for college, only 
That means a shocking 93% of students either dropped out of high school before completing their senior year, or if they did manage to graduate and earn a high school diploma, they still could not do math nor reading without remediation if they were to go to college. Many thoughtful leaders across the country have been trying to solve this problem for some time. Indeed, if you read the mission statement of virtually any education reform organization, you will find earnest language around closing either or both the racial or class achievement gap. Instead of seeking educational excellence for all, School reformers have become fixated on erasing disparities at the group level. Most frequently, the underperformance of black children relative to their white classmates. The problem with this, what I call color-bound thinking, is that achieving equity, as defined as equal outcomes by group, it's the wrong goal, and it's a strategy that has failed to work. In a widely read 2019 study published in Education Next magazine, noted Hoover Institution fellow Eric Hanischek and a team of researchers demonstrated that the academic achievement gap between rich and poor has not budged for 50 years. Similarly, the racial achievement gap has barely narrowed over the same period of time. By its very nature, the black-white achievement gap establishes black as inferior and white student performance as the standard that we should be seeking to achieve. Yet, the majority of white students in our country cannot read and haven't for generations. Indeed, in no year since the nation's report card was first administered in 1992 has a majority of white students been reading at what's called NAEP proficiency reading levels. The sad irony is that closing the black-white achievement gap, if we were actually able to do that, would guarantee only universal mediocrity for all students. Basically, the black-white achievement gap obscures far more than it reveals and masks powerful factors driving education underperformance for young people of all races, most notably the decade-long explosion in non-marital births and the entrapment of parents in dysfunctional school systems without the power of school choice. Moreover, the multi-decade obsession with close achievement gaps has failed to not only not close achievement gaps, but also has not substantive, substantively increased overall achievement levels. On the nation's report card reading assessment in 2022, just here, only 33% of all fourth grade students performed at or above the NAEP proficiency levels. And 37% of fourth graders performed below basic, which is the lowest level in reading. Some of that is due to uh, the pandemic, but these uh, proficiency levels existed even before the pandemic. With a decades-long failure to improve educational outcomes, two distinct paths to achieving this goal have emerged. The first, agency, which I am posing as the empowering alternative to equity, finds the solution in emphasizing equality of opportunity for individuals. In this view, society's obligation is to remove as many barriers to success as possible and provide differentiated support to each young person so that he or she can pursue their own potential to the best of their ability. This approach places the reins of personal destiny firmly in the hands of the individual, while also requiring what I call character-forming or mediating structure institutions like family, faith, and education to play their essential role in the moral development of the individual. 
The second approach, equity, is the absence of inequity. It views unequal outcomes at, at the group level as a de facto indictment of a race, of a biased or discriminatory system. Ibram Kendi, the now discredited author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, is famous for saying, when I see racial disparities, I see racism. In this view, societal oppression is the cause of group disadvantage. So therefore, it's society's obligation to fix it. Because the equity view holds that the system and all its actors are responsible, it points to solutions that require top-down behavioral change of other people for, for progress to be made. In my view, these two approaches, agency and equity, are ultimately irreconcilable. The fundamental issue with an equity-based approach is that it is reductionist, typically rejecting a multi-causal analysis and instead insists that, for example, black children be wholly, wholly viewed solely through the prism of race, having no agency to overcome in the minds of these theorists an insurmountable discrimination based on skin color. How has this played out in the real world, the world of equity, to pursue to this attempt to level group disparities? It often means that leaders lower or eliminate educational standards so that students are left with a false sense of achievement and scant practical skills. I'll give you just two examples. For example, in New Jersey, just a few months ago, in, in, um, in 2023, the State Board of Education voted to lower the minimum passing score on the state's high school graduation test. According to the former superintendent of New York Public Schools and the former New Jersey Commissioner of Education, quote, one board member who supported lowering the passing score suggested that it was unfair to black and Latino students to require underperforming students to demonstrate a higher level of proficiency in reading and math before graduating. Why would the school board so blatantly reduce the standard? Well, under the prior passing score, only 39% of students would be graduation ready in reading. With the decision to reduce the required score, the graduation ready numbers would leap to 80% in reading. Voila, student mastery achieved. Another example, in California, only 33% of students meet or exceed the math standards. Rather than address the underlying issue that California students do not have a basic understanding of addition, subtraction, division, and multiplication in the name of equity, California has released standards that interweave socio-political consciousness into mathematics class. A sample lesson from the new standards includes a word problem that compares the lengths of different ribbons, but intentionally devolves into a discussion around oppression, because the hypothetical fourth grade student is said to be transgender. This is math class injecting identity politics into instruction. It does not have to be this way. If we truly want to achieve educational excellence for all, the empowering alternative of agency can lead the way. I define agency as the force of your free will guided by moral discernment. The force of your free will guided by moral discernment. So think of agency as a vector. It's like velocity, where velocity is not just speed, it's speed and direction. So if agency is free will plus moral discernment, where does moral guidance come from? How do young people learn how best to exercise their free will? No one is entirely helpless, nor should anyone be expected to pull themselves up 
by their own bootstraps. Agency, in my view, is individually practiced, yet socially empowered. In my book, Agency, as Jason said, I propose a new framework, free, based on encouraging young people to embrace four pillars, family, religion, education, and entrepreneurship, a revitalization of four local mediating institutions that drive human flourishing. We can talk about each of the pillars in the Q&A or at the reception. Today, though, I'll focus within the education framework. And within education, one of the first things that has to happen is that young people and their parents need the power to choose a great school. In the district that we just opened our high school, District 12, where only 7% of kids uh, graduate from high school ready for college, there currently is a legislative barrier, a cap that restricts the ability to open new charter schools. So if you had a great idea, you could not open a school in this neighborhood. Thankfully, in many uh, states across the country, there is now increasing opportunities for charter schools, education savings accounts, vouchers. But still, the need is great. I think the number is still about three million kids around the country are on wait lists for charter schools. But along with more education freedom and school choice, it's very important to build new institutions that model what we aim to accomplish. This means teaching the rising generation a full history of their country, warts and all. It means letting them know they live in a good, if not great, country, one that is not hostile to their dreams. With that in mind, I have now launched Vertex Partnership Academies, a public charter high school in District 12 in the Bronx, which seeks to develop virtuous high school graduates who have acquired the habits, knowledge, and sense of personal agency necessary to lead self-determined, purposeful lives of American and global citizenship. Students at Vertex Partnership Academies will learn a core and lasting body of knowledge which includes the basic principles of constitutional government, mathematics, science, and language skills in Spanish and Mandarin, important events in world and US history, and the classical acknowledged masterpieces of art, music, theater, poetry, and literature. Vertex is organized around the four cardinal virtues of courage, justice, temperance, and wisdom, both as an expectation for each student and faculty member in our community to personally adopt, and as a conceptual framework that shapes every aspect of school culture, policies, canon, our rituals, our curriculum, our award ceremonies. Courage, justice, temperance, and wisdom are called cardinal virtues from the Latin root cardo, which means hinge, because these are the root virtues upon which all other standards of moral excellence depend. Each cardinal virtue is an intrinsic life habit that Vertex seeks to cultivate within each student. When normed and practiced regularly, these individual behaviors then form the collective basis of a good society, a community that is governed, self-governed, by public virtue. And for each cardinal virtue, we have devised what we call an I statement. Requiring students to memorize these I statements is part of the process for how we want young people to internalize their sense of personal responsibility and agency. And I'll read you the, each of the statements. For courage, the I statement is, I reject victimhood and boldly persevere even in times of uncertainty and struggle. Justice, I uphold our common humanity 
and honor the inherent dignity of each individual. Temperance. I lead my life with self-discipline because I am responsible for my learning and my behavior. And finally, wisdom. I make sound judgments based on knowledge of objective, universal truth. If we want to build a self-governing, free society, then we need to cultivate individuals that have the ability to self-govern themselves. The idea here is that our students will first learn these virtue definitions in their head and ultimately in their hearts to manage their own attitudes and behavior. In this spirit, we reject any ideology that robs young people of the values they need to carry within themselves to lead self-determined lives. No person is simply a stand-in for a group. We believe it's time for a choice, that we're faced with a unique opportunity to lean into the promise of our country. In my view, the answer is clear. It's agency over equity, dignity over dependency, resilience over reliance, and self-determination over servitude. Let me close by quoting from de Tocqueville's America, who said, quote, the greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened than any other nation, but rather in her ability to repair her faults, end quote. I've always loved that quote because it emphasizes the idea that America has within it the tools for self-renewal and self-betterment. In the same way, I want young people in our schools to know that they have within themselves as individuals the tools of self-renewal and self-betterment, and that part of their civic duty is to work towards the betterment of themselves and their country. That is agency. Thank you. To get us started for our question and answer time, I've got a few questions that uh, I have for Ian, but then after that, we'll uh, have an opportunity for people from the audience to ask questions as well. So when we get to that point, if you'd like to ask a question, we have a microphone over on this side uh, that we'd invite you to step up to for, for your question. We do ask that your question be a question rather than a <laughs> statement. Uh, and then after you've asked your question, if you could return to your seats and allow others to have the opportunity to ask them as well. Ian, one of the things that stood out to me as you were talking, right, as you're talking about the curriculum at, the, at your school, yep. um, you go through part of that list and you probably have a whole bunch of head nodding, oh, yep, yep. that math and the history yep. and the, right? And then you talk about cardinal virtues mm. and personal agency. Yeah. I'm interested if you could give us a sense of the, uh, the reaction, parents and others. What has your lived experience been yeah. with beginning to, to, to have that type of curriculum in the school? Yeah, it's very interesting. You know, the, we, are, we are in the midst of uh, very heavy uh, educational debates in our country, and you often hear this term indoctrination. You know, these kids are being indoctrinated into these terrible ideas, um, and depending on what side you're sitting on, uh, you are hostile to the idea of indoctrination. But the point is, if you run a school, if you run any institution with young people, you are indoctrinating them into something. There are values that you are evidencing by the behavior of the adults, of the school, your rules, your policies. And so even if you're choosing to do nothing, you are telling kids that there's no moral frame for which they should make decisions. And so as we were designing Vertex, we said, you know what? We're gonna be deliberate about what it is that we're indoctrinating our students into. And for us, the cardinal virtues um, provided the, the foundation because they truly are the foundation upon which all other character-based strengths are built. So it's something very, very important to us. What has the, what the reaction been? We think phenomenal. You know, 
when we opened last year in 2022, we had the four cardinal virtues, but frankly, we were a little um, less prescriptive. Mm -hmm. We just said courage and we had uh, exercises where we asked the kids, you know, what does courage mean to you? You know, what does temperance mean to you? You know, ask a 14 year old what, <laughs> what, what uh, temperance means or, or self-restraint or self-discipline. They don't know yet. Yeah. They're kids. We need grown-ups to act like grown-ups, responsible grown-ups where we share the wisdom of the ages. And so this year, we actually crafted those definitions. And so now our students are standing strong. They encourage. They say, I reject victimhood and boldly persevere even in times of struggle and uncertainty. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, I lead my life with self-discipline because I am responsible for my learning and my behavior. So we think the, the crafting of the I statements have really created even more of a connection, not just intellectually, because you know, they're gonna memorize the words, but it goes beyond this. You know, part of our curriculum is also you know, learning great works of poetry. And one of the poems that our students uh, are, are learning now is Invictus by William Ernest Henley. If you're familiar with it, it's an incredible allegory of overcoming adversity and, and understanding what William Ernest Henley was going through in his personal life to write this poem. But the last two lines, imagine, you know, imagine our lunchroom, all of our students are standing up in their uniforms with their beautiful blazers, reciting the last two lines. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. You know, it's, it's powerful. And, uh, you know, in that moment, our school motto, which is, there are no victims in our school, only architects of their own lives. And you just feel it. You feel like that's the foundation from our students can build a sense of who they are and what they have it, the ability to accomplish. Opportunities for. So as you talk about us being at a, 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 an inflection point, right, of pass forward for education and directions of things, this last summer, the Supreme Court, right, issued a ruling yeah. uh, that effectively ended race-based admissions at colleges and universities. Yeah. As a longtime educator, what's your thoughts and reflections on that decision? Well, I, uh, I actually posted uh, a comment on Twitter, or I guess now X, uh, and I said, uh, years from now, uh, black students at elite institutions will look back at this decision and say thank you for removing the perceived stigma that the only reason I got into this school is because of my skin color. Mm -hmm. That posting got more than a million views and a lot of responses, many in support, but many saying, how could you say that? This is the worst thing ever mm -hmm. uh, for black students. And it really just showed how how much we are in conflict on this topic. I think it was a sound uh, decision. And in fact, we had the honor to take about 60 of our 10th grade students to visit with Justice Clarence Thomas. We went to the Supreme Court and had an opportunity to meet with him. And our students had studied the ruling. And they had an opportunity to meet with a Supreme Court justice to talk about race-based affirmative action and what the rationale was for preserving uh, status quo and for overturning it. And for anyone who's actually read the case, I mean, most people don't take the time to actually read uh, these decisions, but the data from Harvard and University of North Carolina, any objective review, it was blatantly obvious that the schools were uh, discriminating against uh, Asian and white students in favor of, of black and Hispanic students. And what was interesting was that after we had time uh, at the Supreme Court, we then uh, took our students to American Enterprise Institute where we met with the president, Robert Doors. It was an amazing day. And I, and I asked the kids the question, so after um, listening to everything you've heard all day, do you think you should have, ever have an inherent advantage or an inherent disadvantage based on your skin color to be considered for college. And none of our students thought either should be the case. It was very interesting. 
Um, I mean, the other thing that I, I think most people need to recognize that those cases <laughs> ref, uh, affect a very, very, very small percent of kids that are going to school. And frankly, if you're concerned about race-based affirmative action as being the issue in um, of providing opportunity, you're starting way too late. Because if you look at, again, national assessment data in 2015 of black fourth graders, based on the national assessment for educational progress in 2015, about 18% were reading at grade level based on um, NAEP scores. And NAEP has it so that you can look at cohorts at, at four-year interval intervals. So that same cohort of black students in eighth grade now in 2019, so remember, 18% of fourth graders reading at grade level, four years later, that number of eighth graders, black eighth graders, is now 15%, mm. right? And now, four years later, 2023, the year that same cohort of black 12th graders would be apl applying to college, all the data suggests that less than 20% are reading at grade level. Because of phenomena that occurs in K-12 education, most notably this practice of social promotion, which is when you're promoting kids from one grade to the next, even though they haven't mastered the material, the problem is the vast majority of kids, black kids and frankly kids of all races, are not effectively prepared. So while there's a lot of drama around you know, aff uh, affirmative action and college admissions, the issues that our kids face originate far earlier. And this, the discussion we had earlier about agency versus equity, I think, is where we should be spending much more of our time. Focus. One more question, then I'll, I'll open it up to the audience. So you've been in education for a long time, but as I've been learning about you know, the free model and, 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 and uh, getting into your book and the free forums that you've been doing yeah. around the country, You've got some other letters there, right? So you, <laughs> yes. you, you got your E for education. Yes. We've got this F for family and R for religion and E for this entrepreneurship. Yep. What led you to kind of the expansion of your thinking and the yeah. bringing in of those social institutions? Yeah, it's interesting. When I when I first started, uh, even when I when I first started running public charter schools in 2010, I was an education guy. You know, I just thought. I, I'm, I'm a product of a New York City uh, public education, K through 12. I went to Brooklyn Tech High School. Uh, I had a great K to 12 education. I just thought education is the common pathway, a strong tuition-free public education. And uh, it, it is a bedrock. But as I learned actually in running schools, if you're being really honest, um, there's no way one can ignore a lot of other factors that are driving underperformance of kids. And uh, this really hit me, and I write about this in the book, but I had an epiphany moment on July 11th, 2016, at about 4 p.m. in the afternoon, this hot summer day. Uh, and this was in 2016, so I'd been running this network for about six years. And again, at that time, our schools were doing quite well. There was a huge demand especially in the Bronx, uh, for new schools. So we made a strategic decision that all of our new schools would open in the South Bronx. And at the time, our headquarters were in Manhattan, in Tribeca. So once we made the decision that all of our new schools would be in the Bronx, we moved our headquarters from Tribeca, where you, know, you can get a, a latte on the corner, to uh, 149th Street and 3rd Avenue, which literally had a needle exchange on the corner, so it was quite a different uh, setting. And a number of my staff were, uh, you know, a little nervous that we were moving into what was, you know, a high crime, high poverty area. But that's where our kids were, and they we needed to build great schools. So why not have our headquarters there? And so my epiphany moment uh, occurred though when we decided to go on a walking tour to get to know the neighborhood. You know, where's the local bodega? Where's the local bank? Um, you know, where you know, there was local deli, and as we were walking uh, in the distance on 149th Street, I saw uh, this 27-foot baby blue Winnebago mm -hmm. truck, and there were all these adults around this truck, excited that it was there. 
And it was interesting. It was literally almost like uh, when you see the ice cream truck <laughs> show up and there are little kids that are really excited that it's there. But in this case, it's adults, it's grown-ups. And as we're walking closer, I notice graffiti lettering on the side of the truck. And that graffiti lettering said, who's your daddy? I'm like, what's that? Well, it turns out that the Who's Your Daddy truck is well known in the Bronx and other parts of New York and in Chicago and DC and Baltimore because they travel to provide their services. The Who's Your Daddy truck is a mobile DNA testing center where low-income folks are spending somewhere between $350 and $500 wow. to answer questions like, you know, could you be my sister? Are you my father? Like profound questions about identity, and in particular, family structure. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've been running schools for six years in the Bronx, so it's not I was unaware that family structure, family dysfunction was often an issue for our kids, but there was something about seeing that truck and the normalcy of it that just made me realize that running great schools, necessary but not sufficient. And as I started doing research, in, of this particular part of the Bronx, the non-marital birth rate was 84%. Mm. And uh, it just really struck me, where were our kids seeing different models for how to build their life, to build their future family, to think differently? Because the cycle of disadvantage is just perpetuated, and the more I learned about what was going on in the Bronx, it's in Chicago, it's in rural Appalachia, it's in Los Angeles, it's in Houston. There are pockets of our country where this is the norm. And so that's when I really started to believe that there were other elements that we needed to talk about. So my E, I got the F in there, the, the, <laughs> and then I started looking at data on religiosity uh, and the fact that uh, you know, kids who have a personal faith commitment in their own lives have far different and lower levels of alienation, depression, anxiety. You know, it, it, so even though religiosity is down, we want to help young people understand that this is one of the levers that you have access to in your life that can be incredibly powerful. And E for education, I've become much more a uh, proponent of school choice and educational freedom so that more kids can get access to schools like ours. Uh, and then the last D of entrepreneurship, in some ways, uh, the F in family is, is, it's not so much about the family that you're from, it's about the family that you're on the pathway to form, uh, which is why we teach something in our schools called the success sequence, which is data that says if a young person finishes a high school degree, then gets a full-time job of any kind, and then if they have children, marriage first, 97% avoid poverty, and the vast majority enter the middle class or beyond. So we actually teach that in our class in a descriptive fashion. So family, religion, education, if you have those three as a foundation, uh, that usually helps you build what I would call an entrepreneurial mindset. You're a problem solver uh, in your life when inevitable challenges come your way. So that's how the, the free framework really evolved Came over together, time. Fits around it. Thank you, Ian. Yes. Uh, let's open up now to, to anyone in the audience who'd like to ask a question. Like I said, if you'll just step to the microphone over there, Ian would be happy to uh, address some of your questions. Yeah. Hey, I'm Brendan Smith. Um, you talk about agency as a moral agency. It's a uh, it's a liberty that's separate from license because you're deciding to do things that you know are right in accordance with virtues like courage. But people will talk about equity in moral terms as well. Um, people like Kendi um, or any college student who says, I need to make this immoral choice, they will say, well, it's actually the right choice. And if you stop me from um, transitioning to the other gender or if you um, expect of me the same things you expect of white students as, as a Hispanic, um, then you are being judgmental and are harming me. So how do we speak persuasively 
to people who are convinced that talking about agency is, is harmful to them? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. And when you say that uh, people would say that you're being judgmental, um, you know, I will own that a little bit, actually, um, because for some reason we've actually lost our ability in society to speak obvious truths. Uh, for example, uh, if you, there's a lot of people who, who, uh, who do work here on the structure of families, and it's quite clear that the evidence is overwhelming that children raised in married two-parent households do far better on a number of dimensions than children raised in single-parent households. Now, that doesn't mean that we should demonize single parents, nor does it mean that every child born to a single parent uh, is doomed to failure, nor does it mean that every child uh, raised in a married two-parent household is going to be successful. But the data is overwhelming, and yet there are many people who gain the benefits of being married, uh, bring all the privilege that means for their child, and yet they feel uh, constrained to state the obvious in terms of preaching what they have practiced in their own life to be successful. And that's why, in many ways, I'm trying to do the work that I do, which is to give courage. Like, you're not judging. You're actually sharing with the rising generation a wisdom that has existed for ages that we shouldn't shy away from. And so it is tough because I do feel that people seem to be um, self-censoring on uh, issues that, in a way, they almost know would be harmful to a young person, but they're feeling that I can't impose. Like, for example, we teach the success sequence in our schools, you know, education, work, marriage, and children. Now, we teach it in what we call a descriptive fashion, not prescriptive, meaning that we don't say, you must do this, but we do say, look, you're, you're the architect of your life. In the next 10 years, you're going to be making decisions about relationships, work, <laughs> education. You should know that there are different uh, decision paths that you will likely take and that there are different likely rewards or consequences associated with those uh, different um, decision paths. Here's one that says 97% of the time you'll avoid poverty. Here's another that says it's a much higher percentage of, you know, but ultimately you decide. So how do you speak? Uh, you know, my thing is I just try to be um, as upfront as possible as why I think uh, I'm not actually necessarily arguing against something as much as I'm arguing for something. So the cardinal virtues are our way to say here is an empowering alternative. And there's lots of data that supports the idea that if you form a strong family, if you have a personal faith commitment, if you benefit from educational freedom, your likelihood of success, however you want to define that in your life, is dramatically higher. That's what I attempt to do as opposed to um, demonizing or always being in an opposition uh, to ideas. Thanks. My name is Sam. Um, this is great. I'm, I have a lot of questions that I'm going to take to further research, but uh, all, all this, you know, we're talking about cardinal virtues. They come from a Christian background, and it, you said they're the root of all the other virtues, and I think for something like listening to opposing viewpoints or having the courage to speak your mind in, in vir virtue, like those are good things that do come from the cardinal virtues, but there are other virtues that also come from Christianity, like charity or patience, and... They're, they're more, at least I see them as interpersonal virtues. Where do you see the relationship between those and the other main virtues you were discussing earlier? Yeah. Well, I mean, even just the ones you just said, charity, I would say, is you know, somewhat derivative out of um, justice. You know, I, I uphold our common humanity and honor the inherent dignity of each individual. Um, what was the other one? Oh, patience you know, temperance, I practice self-discipline uh, because I am responsible for my own learning and behavior. You know, I've, I've um, I, I do, I, I really believe almost every 
character-based strength that we want our young people to develop over time is usually some outgrowth of, of uh, one of the four virtues. And, you know, we, we are choosing books, we're choosing literature, poetry, art, music that will show um, uh, character-based strengths like responsibility, determination, perseverance. So it's not always, you know, it must be courage. It, we just always keep reinforcing this idea that at its foundation, these are the anchors for our school. So I don't, so I don't, I don't, I don't think it's at um, a conflict, I guess, is what I'm saying. Interesting to note, too, particularly for the students, right? We're seeing a, an explosion right now in virtue science, right? And the movement of models and measurement and ways to bring virtues into uh, ways of studying and, and uh, relationships, like you said, interpersonal settings and context, social settings. So uh, it's moving far beyond just the language of Aristotle or the language yeah. of Sunday school. Uh, it's very much becoming the language of science and understanding human flourishing. Uh, so there's, I, I think, some pretty significant yeah. foundations that can tie into as well. Yeah, and I guess I actually would also say, because you, you, you wisely said, you know, even folks like Kendi or others who are, for example, proponents of things like equity, they will appropriate language like the virtues and put it in the context of what they're advocating for. But, for example, if justice means I uphold our common humanity and honor the inherent dignity of each individual, then that leads me down a pathway where I don't have a worldview that's solely based on group identity. That if you're black or you're white, you're an oppressor or oppressed, then that's a conflict with the definition of virtue, of, of the virtue of justice that we've defined for our students. So, you know, the name of my book is uh, Agency, but in many ways, the word that I want you to, to leave with in this conversation is courage, because that's the virtue that has to be invoked uh, any time you want to, you know, practice any of the other three. And there will, you will be in situations where someone will say, well, I practice courage in fighting, uh, you know, in some unethical way. And so you always have to come back to, well, you may be using the term, but not in the way that is most aligned with its original meaning. Looks like we'll have time for these last two questions, so let's go ahead. I'm Zach. Thank you so much, Ian, for your um, presentation. I'm really excited about this for my own life and also for other people. And I've noticed when I'm focused on how my actions can positively benefit other people, I just have an increase of enthusiasm and excitement to pursue goals. And I'm curious, so this idea of altruism and focusing on the needs of other people and how I can benefit others, I've just seen that that has actually improved my mood mm. and improved, helped me overcome challenges probably more than, than other things. So I'm wondering, yeah. what do you see, what do you predict or what have you seen so far in, with the principle of agency and the things that you are hoping to teach to the young students and to everyone about, about this idea of agency? How do you see that contributing to yeah a focus on finding purpose and serving others, yep. and turning outward. Beautiful, yeah, so agency, um, you know, we typically talk about it in the context of improving your own self, but in our school, service, service in action, actually is a big part of our program, that our students who have to volunteer in the community, we build relationships with local community-based organizations. We've actually just taken over an old Catholic school campus that closed in 2013, so we're, we're bringing it back to life. So our students are actually gonna be part of the process of updating our fields, and, and there are other things that we'll be doing in the local community, but yeah, it's an important part, you know. I uphold our common humanity and respect the inherent dignity of each individual. So if we go and work in a homeless shelter or, you know, or any other place where there might be people who have less than our kids we honor that inherent dignity. And by the way, many of our kids are in challenging situations themselves, but there's always an opportunity to give. There's always an opportunity to share your wisdom. And even within the school, we'll probably, once we get to, right now we're grades nine and 10, once we get to grades 11 and 12, 
we likely will have mentoring relationships where our 12th graders will be mentoring our 9th graders and there's some local elementary schools in our neighborhood and I'll probably want to have one of our service uh, activities be our 12th graders mentoring elementary school students. Final question. Hi, my name is Emmy Peichels. Really enjoyed today. Um, one big takeaway that I've taken is this concept that um, our education systems and education should and can be more. I feel like your description of incorporating family into education processes as well as putting your school in a location in the Bronx where it had the potential to lift that entire community. Um, I love that concept and I'm just curious if you guys have explored any opportunities to incorporate adult education um, mm. into your school, maybe of the parents of the kids who attend or anything like that? Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, the answer is yes, I want to. Uh, um, uh, but first, we have to build a great school for our kids. Um, so there are actually uh, several uh, public charter schools in New York who've built these amazing buildings that they have full control over. Oftentimes, real estate is a, a huge challenge, but I won't go down that road. And what they've done is they've opened up the school in the evening. They've opened up the building in the evening so they can have computer classes, uh, particularly now um, English as a second language. At our school in the Bronx, uh, about a month ago, we got about 12 students who maybe two or three months ago were in Venezuela and Honduras and have just shown up at our school. And now we're literally on full on English language instruction, um, but there is a, there's a huge need uh, for uh, institutions that want to serve both kids and adults. So that is an aspiration. Um, I think it will probably be a few more years for us, but the concept of local schools, like for example, um, uh, where we've just taken over the old Blessed Sacrament uh, campus, for, that was the, when it was open, it was the anchor in the community. I mean, it was constantly in use by kids and grown-ups. And, uh, and even today, when we've now opened it, and uh, many people who live in the neighborhood who grew up there and remembered when they were in school, they're so excited. So there will be um, that we're now, there's now a school back there. So I envision that we will hopefully become that kind of thriving uh, institution in the community. Join me in thanking Ian for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you.